Howdy, 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 everybody. This is Ryan S. and Ed's Murphy coming to you with another episode of How to Make a Game. Now, specifically, I'll be talking about how to use RPG Maker MV, but since my video series here is about, as much as possible, theory, game theory, and all the things that you really should do before you even start trying, you know, before you open software, what I'm talking about in these videos, at least until I get to where you're actually opening up the program, insofar as I plan on doing that at all, which I'm not sure if I will, it can be applied to pretty much anything you're going to do. Now, if you haven't watched the other videos for some reason, the reason I'm doing it this way is because, you know, using RPG Maker MV is what I'm using and what I'm using for this series when I get to that. But using that as an example, there are a multitude of tutorials on how to do different things within the software. There are a multitude of tutorials on how to do things with graphics. You can find out how to do your own plugins if you're inclined towards doing code. Because MV uses JavaScript. And the same applies to pretty much any kind of software, any methodology you want to apply towards making your games. There are tons and tons of tutorials on how to do specific things, but there's hardly anybody out there that actually talks about all the stuff you should do before you even open up any software at all. Where you really should start. The beginning. So the first video is all about getting ideas and all of that stuff and what you kind of do with that and then in the second video I take everything I talk about in the first video and I show you how to do it I give you a practical demonstration and this is where we're gonna pick up so in the first video I'm gonna go ahead and go back through all this stuff right quick we came up with some characters a basic story our uh, antagonist our primary antagonist Basically, we outlined, because this is what you really should do before you even start opening up any software, worrying about anything else. You need to know what you're going to do, what the game's going to be about, a beginning and an ending, at the very least. So we've got Aethelwolf, the necromancer. He's in debt to a witch hunter, who is uh, Cuthbert of Brede. He's corrupt. Instead of uh, pressing charges or... You know, sometimes there may not even be charges that need to be pressed. He just blackmails people. And then, based off of that, we decided that uh, witch hunters are actually like magic policemen. They uh, police magic users to make sure that they're not abusing their powers, they're not doing anything illegal with them. In the case of necromancers, that they're not... Uh, that they aren't trying to blackmail people by getting dirt on them from the dead and all that sort of stuff, you know? Not trafficking with fell spirits and whatnot. So then we've got Estrid, or Estrid, of Leinster, a queen, or potentially a princess, some somebody royalty. We also determined that this is a world of city-states rather than, like, kingdoms and empires and stuff. Because that's a, a road less traveled, I guess you could say. Uh, most of all, she wants to solve a mystery about her past. Okay? Because I used a lot of uh, randomly generated writing prompts and stuff. Because they're extremely helpful for moving things along instead of just sitting there getting stuck. That was one of the things I pushed the hardest as at least my philosophy of working on anything. Whether you're writing, making music, making games, it doesn't matter. You have to keep moving, because where you start getting frustrated and writer's block and that sort of thing is when you allow yourself to get bogged down. Okay, don't sweat the small stuff. Don't worry about piddling-ass little details that you don't have to sit there and worry about, okay, is basically what I'm talking about. Okay, you don't need to come up with a name for every damn NPC all on your own. That's what those. That's the sort of stuff that random generators are great at. Or, you know, trying to think up a unique story for every single character 
that'll have something to do with the the narrative that is woven, you know, in and out of the primary narrative. You know, trying to think up something different for everybody can be a chore. It can be difficult. So use writing prompt generators or background generators. So that's it's a method that I employ a great deal because it takes a lot of the pressure off and allows me to focus my imagination on the stuff that I actually care about the most, which is fleshing everything out and making it all work together. Um, you know, some people, they're really great at generating ideas for every little last thing, and if you're one of those people, good for you. But I'm not. I need things to give me ideas to, to grow seeds off of. But at the same time, if you, are, if you rely entirely on your imagination for every last little thing, that is also where you're going to start running into roadblocks and writer's block. A lot of the time. Plus, let's be honest, everybody gets ideas from somewhere. I'm just on it being honest and saying that I like to use random generators because it keeps me moving. Especially on, you know, like I said, a random generator will come up with stuff that I can never think of. It'll feed me ideas that I would probably never have. So... You know, it's not that I ne I can't come up with any ideas of my own. That is not true at all. I have more ideas to, than I can actually work with, honestly. But they're always... I'm a big, big view guy. A broad view person. You know, the big picture guy. I have trouble with detail stuff, so that's what I'm, that's what I meant by that. And I'm kind of tan getting tangential here. But, I mean, it's something I firmly believe, is that you should never let yourself get bogged down and you do whatever you possibly can to keep moving. So anyway, I did get off on a side tangent there. So based off of the idea that she has a mystery about her past, we just, it's just it's a bit of a bit of a bit of a mumbly, stuttery crap there. Uh, she doesn't know who her mother was, what happened to her, where she is, if she's dead or alive. So that's the mystery that she's going to be trying to resolve through the course of her story in this uh, game. She's also not a very confident person. Or rather, well, that's kind of her thing over here, is that she appears confident. She's royalty. You know, I I'm probably would change this. Not a queen, but... Um, a noble woman rather than a queen and an heiress instead of a princess. There we go. So, um, and we can actually go ahead and write this down because I hadn't actually typed it up before. She appears to be very composed and confident, but dot dot dot. She wants others to accept her, to believe she's special and worthy of merit. Very self-conscious about her social flaws and real or perceived breaches of etiquette. Uh, she's terrified of rejection. And she may just go to ex extraordinary lengths to be accepted by and or seek and seek favor from her peers. Okay, then we've got Baldrick of Pointworthy. Uh, uh, instead of Prince, let's say... Um... Dissatisfied Nobleman. Character, he's a character who would do almost anything to be uh, attractive. Yeah. Yeah, he's not an attractive person. 
he's kind of ugly, but and all he wants in life is love. He wants a family. He because he, he had a horrible home life growing up, and that's all he wants. You know, he has money and power, but he doesn't have love. He doesn't have a family. He doesn't have anybody that he can care about or that cares about him. That's all he really wants. Uh, didn't really get into this character too much. Another nobleman, Sabald Collier, he desperately wants to retrieve a stolen item and defeat his rival, so he's a bit of a power-hungry asshole type of character. At least that's how it seems in my head. Agatha Strathwaite, Watt, an heiress. She's not confident. Outwardly or inwardly. The major villain of the story is her father. She wants, desperately wants to win his approval, but at the same time she hates him. Most of all, she wants to establish her own city-state. And we've got our last character, Selwyn of Winby, a cartographer. She has involvement with a Miss Brood. I'll get to that. She's the wife of an abusive spouse. She wants to get away from him. Uh, she, she's a cartographer. She wants to map the entire world. That's her, her, her dream, is to go out into the world and map the whole thing. And, and to try to get away from her husband, she's trying to summon Miss Brood in order to kill him. And she's searching ancient ruins for clues on how to summon them to do that. Her uh, husband wants her to be a normal wife. Completely unsupportive, talks shit about her all the time, talks down to her all the time, smacks her around sometimes. Generally, just a bad dude. An asshole. And she can't just leave. I drew some uh, inspiration from Smokey and the Bandit here. She can't just leave because he's the son of a local judge. If... If she tried to leave, and she has before, he, they just send people out to drag her back. And probably rough her up or something. I didn't go that deep into it, but one can assume. So then we worked on the setting. And I don't want to go back through every last bit of this, but... You know, you can watch the last video for that. Since I spent so much time rambling about... Random generators again. I just, I guess there's part of me that feel that thinks that maybe some people look down on doing that. I don't know why they would, but I guess some people might. Honestly, I don't really care that much, but I do, for some reason, feel a, a need to justify it. I don't know why. Because, like I said. You do what you gotta do. You find out what works for you, and that's what you do when you're trying to do anything creative. It's the only way you can get by. So, game mechanic stuff. You're probably thinking, Ryan, surely you have to open up software of some, some sort in order to think game mechanics. No, you don't. You just have to have a general idea of what you're going to be using is capable of. I know more or less what I can get away with using RPG Maker. I also know what, you know, the Yanfly or Yanfly's uh, plugins are what I use almost exclusively. And I know what most of those are and what, and some of the things that they can do. So, you know, yeah. Whatever method you're going to be using, whether you're use you whether you're one to use RPG Maker, NV, or one of the older versions, a Unity or whatever, you just need to know what it's capable of. And again, this whole thing, this is about avoiding frustration. And one of the things that can become frustrating is trying to balance a shitload of different mechanics that you've thought were really cute, really nifty, really clever, or whatever, and then you get into the actual process of making the game and realize, oh god, how am I going to balance all this out? Well, the, your problem is that you didn't try to get anything balanced out on paper ahead of time. You figure out the basic mechanics first and how you're going to balance things, and then you can add to it later. Because once you have your basic stuff set down and 
paper or, or, or in a text file or something, then it's just a matter of tweaking things. Because honestly, the numbers don't matter in the end. And what I mean by that is that let's use uh, the basic stats, and I'll give you an example. Here I need like a a table of uh, let's see two rows is fine. I need eight here. So the eight stats, the the, the main active stats in RPG Maker are hit points, magic points, attack, defense, magic attack. Magic Defense, Agility, and Luck. You can name these whatever you want. Uh, lately I've taken to calling like Attack Strength or some Vigor, you know, a Toughness, Willpower, Intelligence. You know, look up some different RP, uh, pen and paper RPGs for ideas. There's, you know, you have eight to work with and these two are metered, as in they go up and down during battle. The other ones affect other things. And then you have uh, other ones like accuracy, counterattack, uh, magic reflection, magic evasion, evasion, um, target rate. There's all kind. There's a bunch of sub stats, and you can do fun stuff with those too, especially using Yanfly's plugins. But just uh, consider this. So let's say, for the sake of hy hy uh, hypothetical stuff here, that we want our enemies and therefore our characters, or at least we want. Um, let's uh, consider the characters first. So let's say that within the game itself, we want uh, a, a stat curve, and this is this is just one system you can use. Okay, actually let's go ahead and increase this, and no, I needed more, not less. Okay, let's say, and this is a system I've used. Let's go ahead and just move this over here so we can look at it all on one. So four, let's go ahead and get one more in here. Uh, let's go ahead and go to 6, make this a little more interesting. So, within RPG Maker, MV already has a set thing of A, B, C, D, E. Okay, so let's go ahead and get one more thing in here and say, uh, just use number or something like that. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, A... B, C, D, E, F. We're going to take what they've already got in and expand on it a little bit. So, let's say for hit points, and this is for characters, keep in mind, that um, the curve we're going to work with is we're going to have 350... For those, agility and defense run a bit higher, so we're going to go 500 on that. And then for hit points, let's go with, say, 9,000. A little uh, dungeon, uh, Dragon Ball Z. Not Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons Ball Z. Dragon Ball Z. So 9,000. Okay, so this is an A-level stat. This is where we start uh, tweaking things. So here we go to 7,500. Let's actually just drop this 1,000 each one. Four thousand. So go ahead and copy that, paste in. Then this will all be the same. So uh, let's just drop by 25 on each of these. And again, copy, paste, paste, paste. And we'll go ahead and do 25 on these two. All 
All right. So now we have six different um, levels of stats that we can give characters here. All right. So what's our spread going to be? We've got, I think, six characters. Aethelwulf, Estrid, Baldric. That's three. Sabald, Agatha, and Selwyn. So six characters. Okay. Now we can decide how we're going to work with this next. And because we're using... Um, everybody's going to be a magic user. That was one thing we did determine in the last one. Characters are all magic users. But different kinds of spellcasters. And... Uh, I put down enemies that are physical fighters will be very dangerous, but I think we're going to go with, we're going to go ahead and get rid of that. Nope. Okay. So let's say, since we have six levels of stats here, and there's eight stats, let's go with, this will be our, go ahead and do a bullet point here. One level A, one level B, two level C to four, one level D, one level E, and one level E, no, F. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Two level E. Okay, so this is how we'll build our characters. Stats. Okay. Now, after we do this, we have to figure out what of our, what our, how is, uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to phrase this. My mind is stumbling. What's going to be the best way to incorporate gear and other enhancements, leveling up stuff here. Okay. Well, the, the best way to do this is to say that all gear across the board is going to have a maximum increase on any single attribute. And what we want to do here is, once again, we, know that we want another table call this one gear and again we need eight and two all right gear Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, nope, we need one more. There we go. Go ahead and drop the size of that so we can see it better. Alright, so again, HP. I don't know why I'm doing that. I can just... copy there we go so let's see here maximum amount so let's say the maximum amount any of these will go up is we'll just keep this simple a uh, hundreds a bit low so 150 That means that total gear, whatever gear we decide to put into the game, that is the maximum amount it will ever increase any single stat is by 150 for those. Actually, we can go up to, the, say, 200 on these since they're supposed to be a bit higher. And then 1,000 on the two expendable ones, or the metered ones. Okay, so this gives us numbers. And it doesn't matter what numbers you want to work with. You can work with 9 HP if you want. You just knock everything else down. 
it probably wouldn't work very well because you'd be likely to have your characters killed real easily. But you could actually do it. It would just be a matter of uh, extreme balancing on your damage output on both sides. The numbers themselves do not matter. What matters is that you're giving people the combat experience that you want to give them. So, looking at this, we can go ahead and take this table, copy it, paste it. Alright, so we're going to go ahead and knock down the size on here so we can see things a bit better. Alright, so we know that the most HP our characters will ever have is 10,000. Obviously, enemies should be able to get up a little bit higher. Alright, now, there are leveling plugins for enemies as well, but they don't really matter. How you get to these numbers does not matter. What matters is that you keep things balanced. And it also depends on what kind of enemies you're going to have. This game is the kind of game that does not... Uh, it's not going to have big, huge monsters. I think this is the sort of game that's mostly going to have character size enemies. There are going to be other... You know, there's a Yanfly plugin that allows you to use created characters for enemies the same kind of characters that your your player your play as you know everybody else npcs and everybody so honestly i don't think we want stats to be very far off of what the characters can achieve because basically there's going to be six of them Probably all six of them will be active at any given time, although we might just have four or, or whatever. But we can easily have a party of six characters. So basically what you'd want to do is, since we can know our characters can go up to 10,000 on HP, so an A-level enemy stat, and actually one of the things we'd probably want to do here is go ahead and have a boss level so really what we'd want to do here is probably go about 12,000 okay this is still a little too large so there we go that should be good enough all right so they can, on the four stats here, they can get up to 500, possible. So let's say about 600 for enemies. And if you find that that's too high, you can just knock it down. And then they can go up to 700 on that, so let's go ahead and say... 850 here would be acceptable and then we might want to go up say 1400 or 14,000 for a boss maybe 675 because you don't want to go too far above what the characters can actually do otherwise you're going to have enemies that they can't hurt which is why actually what I'd probably do here is more like 650. Make it more about having that they have much higher health rather than just absurd level stats. And we can just go up to like 900 on these because that's a pretty good boost. And then let's see. For a B level enemy, we might do like uh, go ahead and just drop this down to 9,000 actually uh, 
Um, do it like this. There we go. Get our adjustments in there. So we're going to drop from about 850 on that one. Just go ahead and go 800. 750. 700. 650. 600. And remember, these are maximums. This is not where you're going to have all your enemies. This is your maximums. Which is why it's actually easier to do this with a leveling program. Or a plug-in, I should say. Come on, you can fit in there. There we go. Had to knock that one down, but alright. So, just by doing something like this, and you don't have to stick to this, you don't have to do it this way, this is just an example of how you can do some balancing before you even start making the game. Because balancing, a lot of it happens, it's about numbers. It's also about what enemies do and the attacks and all that stuff. But this gives you a starting point. This gives you something to work with. So we have our, basically our characters here will have you know the different spread on their stats and this will be their maximum stat level that they can get so we'll take this here and the same basic idea on here for enemies only we're going to do this a little bit different actually instead of doing a bullet list we're gonna go boss a level B level, C level. Okay, now you can go ahead and go all the way to F level enemies if you want, but I'm going to keep this just four. So basically, what you'd want to do here, again, eight stats, two boss level stats, two A level. Okay, so there's a boss. For every for any given stage in the game, you give them two boss level stats, two A level stats, two B level stats, two C level stats. Okay, for an A level enemy, you give them the exact same spread as the characters themselves. Unless you want to make them a bit stronger. Which isn't a bad idea, but still. One A level. One B level. 2C level, 2D level, 1E level, 1F level. Okay, for a B level enemy, we just make it a little bit worse. We don't give it an A level stat, we give it two B level stats, 2C level, 2D level. Uh, level, 1 E level, and 1 F level, 2, 4, 6, 7, 8. For a C level enemy, we simply drop that down and give it 4 C level, 2 D level, 1 E level and one F level. Again, you can do this different ways. I've got one method or one uh, block of stats I wrote out for one game where I have, let's see, Omega four three two one level, Alpha four three two one level. A, B, C, D, E level enemies. Each with their own different spread of stats. Now I'm using a leveling plugin which makes it easier because all I need is the starting stat and then I can look at on the Yenfly 
there there's a leveling calculator on there and then i can adjust i am able to adjust the uh and you can do this the same sort of thing yourself obviously you're you have access to the same plugins i do because yamfly only asks for credit you don't have to pay for them you just have to give credit in the game credits but uh yeah, within the plug-in parameters, you can adjust the formulas and then use the calculator and check everything. So yeah, I have a huge spread of enemy levels for that game, and I just it works for me. I like doing it that way. This this is a method that I tend to use a lot because it gives me a starting point. Like I said, okay, so this gives us a starting point where you can get some initial balancing in there you know the highest amount of stats that your characters will be able to get and there and therefore you can uh, base your enemy stats on what the highest amount your characters can get which isn't a perfect system because if your characters reach a point where they haven't gotten the gear that they probably should have they can start encountering enemies that you have adjusted to be more dangerous based on what you expect their gear to be. But then they haven't gotten that gear yet, so things can get hard harder. See, this is why I actually prefer to keep the amount of stat increase from gear at a kind of a low level. Because that way, even if they haven't you know, if you have, like, say, let's say you want to have some basic types of gear. You want to do the basic stuff. So, some form of a helmet or something on the head, some armor or a robe or something, boots, perhaps. Um, let's see, what else? Maybe a shield for warriors. Or a book or something for uh, magic users. In this case, they're all magic users. So the types of gear will be more specific to people who use magic. So you, the way you can do that is that, again, weapons increase your attack stats. And armor increases defensive stats. So you again, it's just a matter of making sure that Say, for weapons, you can have ten weapons in the game for each character, or of each type you want to use, and then just increase it by 15. You, the first one is 15, 30, 45, 60, so on and so forth until you get up to 150. And the same for armor. That way, even if they're a couple of levels behind on their gear, it's only going to be 30 points difference, which it's enough to be a bit of a, you know, make it a bit harder, but it's not going to make it so much harder that they can't win. You know, and again, this is just one way to do it. You do not have to do it this way. This is just one method. It's one I happen to like to use and I find is very good, especially to just give you something to work with from right from the start. But you don't have to do it this way. If you have something that you'd rather do, then that's fine. So let's get into some of the other types of game mechanics. So we know that everybody's going to use magic. One of the types of magic is going to be uh, necromancy. So, so we do have that, but we don't have anything for the other five. So my thought was something kind of like Magic the Gathering which uses five different colors of magic. Uh, this occurred to me. So we've got necromancy. That would be black magic. I don't want to just rip it off. And we we mentioned chaos magic at some point. So we're going to have chaos magic. And then we've got the four different kinds of spirits that are in here. Setting stuff. So we've got... Uh, the Dark and Light Pantheons. So we've got the Mist Brood, Dawn Wings, 
dust cowlers and gloom claws. So we can incorporate those four concepts in here for our styles of magic. So we can have light, twilight, darkness, and mists. Okay, so this gives us six types of magic. We've kind of got... Uh, and we can also, because we've got necromancy and chaos, it isn't a bad idea to go ahead and, and bring in order and life magics as well. Let's just go ahead and advance this to the next page so we can keep everything on one page for this. So now uh, we know that there's going to be eight different kinds of magic. And we could even key every single one of these to a different stat. As a matter of fact, because we have eight stats, we've got eight types of magic. So this is how you build up your game mechanics. Exact same way you build up everything else. You see where your mind takes you. So obviously, life will be hit points. Um, let's see, MP, magic. I would say chaos would be your magic points. And what, of our, what, are, what are the stats going to be? What are we going to call them? So HP, MP, Attack, Defense, uh, let's do a Magic Attack, Magic Defense, Agility, and Luck. Okay, we'll go ahead and advance this. So, HP, we're associating that with life, obviously. So, let's just call that. In fact, why not, instead of. Yeah, life. Chaos. Darkness. Yeah, I like this as an idea. So defense, let's call that one order. Magic attack. That would be, let's see, huh. necromancy, magic defense, light, agility, uh, let's see, actually let's make this one miss and make luck chaos and that leaves twilight for agility so this is a perfect case in point for how you can really do whatever the hell you want with the stats in RPG Maker NV they do not have to actually represent things like physical attacking in this case each of the eight stats will represent an individual's connection with that particular type of magic. Again, going to the concept, back to the concept from uh, Magic: The Gathering, because the way the game—it's a card game. If you're if you're completely unfamiliar with Magic: The Gathering for some reason, it's a collectible card game, which means that you can play a game with it and collect the different cards. And the way it works, uh, you have a deck. 60 is the minimum usually well i think there's also 40 card but that's a different kind of gameplay usually it has to be a 60 card deck or more but 60 is usually about what you want because it's optimal so you have lands 
there's five different colors of magic. Each has a different kind of land associated with it. And the idea of the setting, the story, the lore, if you will, is that you are a powerful planeswalker, a mage of extreme power that has the ability to actually draw on the natural mana of the land itself. So when you play the game, you lay down a land each turn. You can put down one, unless you have some sort of card that modifies that. And then you tap it, which means you turn the card to the side, and that gives you mana. And then you use that to cast spells. And usually decks are between one to three colors. Very few people play more than those because the more colors you have in your deck, the more land or sources of mana you need. Which there are ways to pull off, but... So the point here, the idea is that... Uh, you know, each character... Or you, you, well, your plane is a character. It's a, there is a role-playing element to it. You have 20 life to start with in the basic format. So we're kind of doing something similar here. Each type of magic is associated or gives you a different stat. And the stats themselves will st still do exactly the same thing that they always do, which is adjust different types of skills and things. But this way we can call it these different things, and even if the function is more or pretty much the exact same, how you uh, present it to the player matters. And there's nothing wrong with the basic stuff, as far as I'm concerned, because you know there's some people, especially people that make a lot of RPG Maker games, or they've been working with the software for a long time. They can get so pretentious and snobby about it. But honestly, does it matter if it's attack instead of strength or fight or something like that? I mean, there are so many only there are only so many words that really make sense if you want agility to still mean the same thing. Speed, agility, dexterity, they've all been used. I collect role-playing game books, pen and paper books. Okay, there are, I've seen most of the different variations on these words, and you can look up synonyms online easily enough. But agility works just as well as anything else. You know, magic attack. Call it willpower, call it intelligence, call it whatever the fuck you want. It all amounts to the same thing in the end. Unless you want to use some plugins and really get creative with the, the stats, which you can do just fine. You For this sort of a game, where we're actually associating each stat with a different kind of magic, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to look into some of the different ways that you can manipulate skills or stats and how they affect the game. And how, you know, how they affect characters and stuff. But for right now... At this stage, all we're doing is getting down ideas. We're getting down basic stuff. So we have an idea of where we're going to go later. So now that we've done that, I'm going to go up, go ahead and bring up a window, and I'm going to show you a Yanfly page here, yanfly.mo. Moe, whatever that is. Okay, so here is the core, the plugin list. Now, there is an awful temptation, I, I'm sure, for new people when they first look at these to either one of two things, either get overwhelmed with just how many there are, or try to use every single one of them right out of the gate. Don't try to do that, please. That's a dumb idea. I'm going to tell you the ones that I use in most games because they're useful. You have to use the core engine. Okay. Now, uh, 
yeah, I'm going to tell you the ones that I pretty much always use, and then the rest of them you can look over on your own, because they're situational, okay? I pretty much always use base perimeter control to some degree. I don't always use it, but I often do. Because this one, it doesn't need to be screwed with unless you have a good idea of what you want to do. Class base per parameters, I've never used. I've never used either of those. Extra parameter formula I use in every game because I like being able to change how your stats affect your extra parameters. So this is a hit rate, evasion, critical, counter evasion, magic evasion, magic reflection, counter attack, hit point regeneration, magic hit point regeneration, and uh, a TRG, it's T, is uh, 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 tactics, tactic points, skill points, regeneration. I always like to play around with these and make it so that luck, or in this case it would be chaos, always has some influence on all of these. And other stats do as well. I, it's, I just like doing that. I like to make it so that all your stats matter. And luck, base game-wise, all luck does is modify some things like that your chance of getting affected by status rates or statuses and stuff. I like to make it more useful and have a, a, an influence over all of these formulas here, the extra parameters. Don't use that one. Message core do use sometimes. Backlog, haven't used it, but you might find it useful. Those I don't use, you might find it useful. Haven't used that, you might want to. Uh, save core I do use sometimes. New Game Plus, haven't played with it. Haven't decided if I want to or not. Might in the future. Uh, special uh, self switches and variables. I've never really had much of a need for more than four switches, self switches, which is what they give you base game, so I haven't messed with that one yet. A special perimeter formula, same thing as the extra ones. I like having your various stats affect your special parameters as well, so I pretty much always use that one. Battle Engine Core, absolutely a must have. And the action sequence packs. Because they add movement. Even if you just use really basic action, action sequences. Sequences. Just some movement is better than none at all. I feel. So I always use those. I always use animated side view enemies. Because I prefer side view to front view. And uh, you know this just adds functionality for... All sorts of stuff with side view enemies, so I always use it. I haven't ever used any of this stuff, and there none of these are being uh, kept up with. So there's. Uh, it looks like this one might. No, that's standard. Turn battle. So yeah. Uh, counter control I usually use. Uh, in battle status, don't use it. Turn order display. I'm using it on the one I'm working on now. But it's an optional thing. Uh, visual HP gauges. Uh, I go ahead and use it all the time on any game I'm working on these days. Because people like to see the HP of the enemies. They like to see how much they've got. And you can either make it as a skill to reveal it. Or I just have it as a default thing. Uh, weak enemy poses can be useful. Uh, if you're willing to put in the time to tweak graphics to get the different poses or you have a pack that gives you different poses that you can use I haven't used that absorption barrier is a useful one I don't use it all the time though again situational it depends on if it fits with your mechanics battle AI core always use it I haven't used it but haven't used it um, don't usually use it. Buff in states core always use it. Extended damage over time always use it. State categories haven't used it. Don't need that one. Visual state effects always use it. Damage core always use it. Armor scaling since it's been introduced always use it. Critical control always use it. Element core always use it. 
Extra enemy drops, always use it. Hit accuracy, sometimes use it, but I think it's a pretty good one to use. Um, again, some of these are just situational. Use them if you want to. Uh, life steal. if I'm planning to have anything that involves life stealing, I'm going to use it. Overkill bonus, have used it. Target core, always use it. Area of effect, usually use it. Uh, let's see, victory aftermath and aftermath level up, always use it. I just, I like having characters able to see, or players be able to see what happens after the battle. Item core, always use it. Just because it, even just on its own, it's a good plug-in, but then, you know, if you want to have things like uh, upgrade items or any kind of crafting system, it's a must-have, along with its supporting plugins. Which, uh, yeah, again, it just depends on what you want to do. Uh, shop menu core, always use it. Skill core, always use it. And things like a limited skill uses, party limit gauge, skill cooldown, skills cost items, instant cast, skill learn system, all that stuff is situational. It depends on the mechanics you want to use. Equip plugin, equip core, always use it. Change battle equip, depends on if you want to allow players to uh, switch items, uh, switch equipment during battle. If you're going to have a lot of elemental stuff, I would recommend this. Okay, like, um, for example, uh, just any kind of elemental stuff. You know, you can use the traditional fire, water, earth, air. Then you can add in things from like uh, Legend of Zelda. Zelda games, I think, has electricity. You can have ice, cold, obviously, uh, wood, metal, chaos, necromancy, light, dark, order, time, acid, poison. Pretty much anything you can think of can be an element in the game. And you can also use elements as racial types. It works really well for making certain enemies weak and against certain things and strong against other things. And if you're going to do that and have things like armor or weapons that... Like armor that protects against certain elements, uh, weapons that deal damage with certain elements, they're very situational when they're useful. So unless you're going to kind of go the predictable old school route of certain areas in the game will have certain types of enemies and just those kinds of enemies which again it's not only predictable it also means that they'll only be able to use those weapons and armor types for that area so I would say mix things up and allow them to change their equipment and have to make choices because that's one of the things that really makes your combat good is making it feel like that they have to make choices. And, you know, if you have a collection of enemies that they're facing, one's ice, one's uh, electricity, one's earth-based, maybe one's fire-based. And these enemies, you could probably get them to even attack each other if they're opposed element types. I'm not sure how you would do it right offhand, but I bet you could do it. Uh, you know, I don't know. It's possible. You'd have to look into it. I'm just brainstorming here. But the idea is that you, if you have four completely different element types, then there's no one loadout that's really going to be perfect. But by allowing them to change their battle equipment, say, once every four turns, four rounds of combat or whatever, you give them the ability to try to take out one enemy at a time, perhaps. Or perhaps one of them is a boss, and it's really powerful, and the others are kind of protecting, protecting it. So maybe by putting on the armor that's good against the boss and then getting their better weapons that they have available, that'll see them through the battle better than just, you know, putting on certain, you know, like the highest defense 
rated armor won't be as good as maybe one that's lower defense but protects against the boss's type of element. So it's very useful in certain situations. It just depends on the game. Uh, which is true for a lot of these. Like I said, I'm just telling you the ones that I use pretty much every game. Weapon animation, always use it. Uh, status menu core, always use it. Battle statistics, always use it. Gameplay, auto passive states, always use it. Haven't used the aura effects. I prefer active skills when you're affecting other characters. Enemy levels, tend to use it because I just like that system. But you don't have to. Difficulty slider, since I use tend to use the enemy levels, I tend to use the difficulty slider. I prefer to do uh, the base parameters for enemies. I don't want to use it like a class. I do it like this. It's just a, again, it's just, it's a preference. It's just a preference. Enhanced TP, I've started using it. I can see the appeal rather than just the base uh, modes. Again, TP is tactics points or skill points. Because you have three different bars in RPG Maker. You have your hit points, your magic points, and then the TP is what you use to use skills and stuff. Or, you know, that's I don't know why they call it tactics points. I prefer skill points. It makes more sense. In this uh, base game, you get a boost every time you're hit, every time you attack something, and every time you guard. And that's it. This gives you more options. Uh, equip battle skills, never used that, never really understood the appeal. I guess uh, to save yourself clutter in your uh, battle screen, I guess I could see that. And also it would add a tactical uh, layer, an extra layer to the tactics of the game. But, you know, I've never used it. Uh, allow types, never used it. Job points, situational. You would use this... Um, like, if you want them to be able to buy their skills rather than just getting them or having to find books or whatever. Party system, always use it. Uh, row, row formation, pretty much always use that because I, it just adds a little extra functionality into your combat that it's easy to set up and it adds something to the combat. And it doesn't really affect balancing that much. It's just a little bit of extra tactics and flavor that I think is really fun. Never use Steel and Snatch. Doesn't appeal to me that much, but I might in the future if I have a game that I think it would work for a certain character. And again, that's the thing. All these different kinds of plugins, it either sh you should either be doing it because it fits the game or one of the characters would benefit from having that plugin in play. And then you expand on its use from there. You don't just throw in all of the plugins and then decide what to use them for. Have a use in mind first. Uh, movement stuff, I haven't really used any of those. Uh, quest plugins, I started using the Quest Journal. It's a bit of a monster to have to get your head around and set up, but I think it's worth it in the long run. Having something to let them know what their quests are. Uh, the options core plugins are new and I've been using them all for the games I've been working on just because people like to have options and it's good to give players options so I, there's no reason not to use them. Uh, event chase player situational I think it's a pretty good one just depends on the game. Uh, chase stealth again all this stuff is very uh, situational and depends on what you want to use it for. If you need it for something. Uh, yeah, pretty much all of this stuff is just, it just depends on if you want it for something. Grid-free doodads I use in every game. Because it, uh, what this one does, if you're not familiar, is that you can bring up your game window... You hit F10, I believe it is, and then you can pretty much freehand, freestyle, plop down. 
anything you have in your doodads folder, image-wise, you can place anywhere on the screen. And it's fairly forgiving in terms of any kind of lag it causes in the game. It doesn't cause too much. You can put quite a bit of stuff on the screen before it starts slowing it down at all. And I would say it's not essential, but it's a great plugin to use because it helps you with one of the things that is it's not game mechanics this is a graphics plug-in but one of the biggest problems with something like rpg maker is that it is very blocky because it works on a grid format and that's just the style of the that style of game so that's not a big deal if i you know obviously if i didn't enjoy that type of game i grew up with those types of games but if i didn't like it i wouldn't be working in that style but what the Grid Free Doodads does is lets you break up the blockiness. And there's some graphics packs that do the same thing, and I recommend finding them. That's why I use the FSM packs, because they, they've always got stuff in there that helps you break up the blockiness. But yeah, just being able to uh, manipulate graphics and place them pretty much anywhere, like right here in this picture. Let me bring this up. Boy, that is kind of distorted. But you see right here, normally you would not be able to place a bear on the bed like that or this doll right up against the cabinet or that pouch up on top of the cabinet. You wouldn't be able necessarily to put the windows in right where the bed is. Because MV allows you two layers on top of floor layers and wall layers as well. And that gives you a lot more functionality for uh, doing your graphics. But you'd never be able to do stuff really like this, where you have this, the two windows and then the map in between them, and then the the plants here are off-centered, and you got a nightstand, and then this wastebasket is right up against the counter. You couldn't do that in the game natively. But with this plug-in, you can put in so many more little details and do all sorts of little things to break up the blockiness. It is that, to my mind, it, for graphics, uh, not gra for mapping, it's essential to breaking up the maps and making them look alive. Uh, the map gold window, you don't have to use it. I kind of like to. I've used, been working, putting it into my last couple of games I started working on. And pretty much everything else here, it just depends on what you want to do, whether you feel like you need it. Some people like this stuff, some people don't. Things like this, a smart jump. It depends on if you want to have jumping in the game. You know, it adds some movement, but, you know, it just depends on if you want it in there or not. Um, slippery tiles, if you're going to have, like, a slip puzzles, slip and slide type puzzles. It's a very useful one to do those with. But if you're not going to do puzzles with it or something else, you don't need it. And this is for using dragon bones, which is a, a skeleton thing for enemies that animates them. I haven't messed with it too much because it's, it's another whole bugbear to have to deal with and I don't want to yet maybe at another time so those are the Yanfly plugins I use pretty much every game and some of the ones I really like to use often the rest as I said entirely situational and have a use in mind for them before you add them to the game okay I start with my core plugins that I pretty much always use, and any that I know I want to use, and then if I have ideas, I go back and I add in more, because there's nothing stopping you from doing that. You just need to make sure they're in the right order, and you can do that easily in RPG Maker and V, and I can show you... Well, I don't need to show it to you, because it's so simple. You have your plugin thing, and you just cut the plug-in and then move it to where you need it and paste it in there. 
Because you can only put them in at the bottom of the list, but then you can move them by doing the cut and paste thing. So you don't need to try to put in every single plug-in and then think of a use for them after you've added them. You think of the use and then you add them. Okay? Make sure you understand what I'm saying here. You know, have the idea first, then add the plug-in. And you can find all sorts of tips and tricks and things that you can do in Yanfly's uh, videos. Just go to YouTube and type in Yanfly. You'll find his channel, their channel. You'll find their channel and you can find all kinds of tips and tricks videos. You can find all the videos on how to use the plugins. You'll be good. <clears throat> there are other things, you know, uh, if you want to use lighting, I believe it's Kaz has a really good lighting plug-in, free and paid options. So most of the things you'll think of that you would want to do within the confines of what RPG Maker can do, obviously, but you can find plugins to do loads and loads of things. And you can still make interesting, good games just with the base stuff, too. I mean, I would recommend using some plugins, even for your first game, just to get your foot in the door, to get your toe wet, your you know your toes wet, however you want to phrase it, so you can learn how to use the plugins. Because they add in so much more functionality, they add in so much depth to the games. But you don't have to use a bunch of them right out the gate either. It just depends on what you're comfortable doing. Okay, so I think we've covered the bases on getting started with game mechanics. We know, you know, we get, we know the basics for this game, this hypothetical game, this uh, outline, abstract, whatever you want to call it. We've been working on here. We have a basic balancing sheet for stats for both characters and enemies. You know, we know we have six different characters, and we we can give them different maximum possible stat amounts for leveling, and then we also know what gear we'll be able to add to their stats. So we can give each of them strengths and weaknesses. We know that there are eight different types of magic, and we've made the decision that since there are eight types of magic and eight different core stats. Each stat is actually going to correspond to one of the types of magic. Even though, at least at this point, they are still going to serve the same functions that they always have. In this case, there's two different kinds of attack skills, two different kinds of defense skills, how fast you are, luck, which is just kind of a miscellaneous stat, and then how much health you've got, how much magical power you've got. This is where you start getting into the challenge of, of coming up with interesting game mechanics, is how can you make each stat feel like something more than just what they normally do? And you can do that with some of those plugins, like the, the extra parameter control, the formulas for that. Because it also... They don't have to do those things. Okay, it depends on the formulas that you want to use inside the game. Uh, for example, this is where I probably should bring up the program, but I won't. I'll just show you here. The basic, the bare bones basic formula attack for any attack in the game is this. Actually, it's attacker attack times four minus battler defense times two. Okay, this is a basic formula. So what this would do is that it takes your attack skill, which here would be darkness, times four, and then subtracts the battler who's being attacked their defense times two, so it cuts it in half. 
if they were exactly the same. And then you also have variance on the skill, which is usually set to 20%. Okay, so Yan Fly's armor plugin changes this dramatically, but for this sort of thing, because we're using it as magic skills, we might not want to use that one and stick to this kind of formula. So we could actually say that... So these two, because they're metered stats they are still going to have to f fulfill that particular function. And that makes it a lot trickier. Because that would mean that their life stat is also possibly up to 9,000. So, here's how you make this work. Healing spells. MP, let's see, for mists, illusion spells. So, how this would work is that you just have the spell probably heals equal to or lesser than their, their life. You probably want to give it a high variance and do something like your basic healing spell would be attacker HP uh, divided by four. And then you could have, say, go ahead and cut that and bring it down here. So that would be your basic spell, and then for the next one you would do by three, let's go ahead and so three, two, then just their hit, and then you could actually I think that's pretty good. You have four different ones, and then you can also do um, heal all spells. And for that, you'd probably want to do it a little bit less, say six, five, four, and... Based in, say, two. Or actually, you could go ahead and do it this way. Three, two, and then that. Okay. So that gives you uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different healing spells. Which is pretty good. You have these ones that are, that are more powerful. They affect one single ally. Then you have the six different uh, ones that heal everybody in the group. That start off less powerful, but eventually you get to the highest level and you can heal the entire party. For your own uh, life score. So, I mean, if you have your life guy up to 9,000, everybody else will be healed. Even if it's only like, you know, six or seven thousand for that character, everybody's going to get healed for quite a bit every time they use their healing spells. And then for the, your attack spells, what you can actually do is base it off of, you know, uh, oppositional stuff. So obviously chaos and order would be opposed to each other, so that's your luck and defense. So you'd actually go like this. And you could actually make it a directly opposed thing, or, you know, the numbers, it depends on what you want to do. 
you know, in the end, the numbers don't matter as much as making sure it's balanced and you're going to give your players a good experience. Certainly, you know, you make sure your skills aren't too powerful or underpowered. So that would be, you know, for a... Let's see, that would be a chaos spell. Whereas, say, uh, light would be opposed to darkness. So let's say that would be... What was that? Attack? Yeah. There. Make that work. So those would be examples of how you could set up your different skills for attacks and stuff. So since a miss, again, would be your MP, you wouldn't necessarily want to use these numbers for attacking because they'd be too high compared to your your uh, base skills, I guess you could call it. And since we're also using these more or less the exact same way we'd use all four of those, we might want to actually make these stats lower. Now, the thing is, agility is always going to be used in the back end of the game for determining battle order, you know, who fights first. And luck is still always going to be used in all sorts of little tweakings of things. There's nothing you can do about that, really. Well, you pr you can do that, something about it, I guess, but if you want to mess with it. But you don't really have to. I think, you know, it just depends on what you want the numbers to be and how you want to use them. Remember, this is all just uh, examples and trying to help you understand uh, what you, the, the stuff you should be thinking of before you ever open up your program. You know, like I said at the beginning of the video, you should be working on all this stuff before you ever open up a single type, any kind of software, be it RPG Maker, Unity, a graphics program, a 3D modeling program, no matter what uh, methods you're going to use to make your game, you need to do an abstract first. You need to come up with an outline. You need to figure out what your game mechanics are going to be, at least the basic stuff. You need to know what you're going to do. What are you going to make? So I think I've covered everything that really needs to be covered about this. I might do other videos on other topics, but I think I've covered what I wanted to cover. At least as much as I can in short videos. I'm writing a book that is going to cover the entire process of making a game. Okay, this is basically, this isn't even just the first three chapters. This is just bits and pieces out of uh, a, few, a few different chapters. I mean, I'm going in-depth on ideas, brainstorming. I'm going in depth on character development, uh, character arc, narrative. There's an enormous section on horror fiction and how to do horror games and all sorts of stuff about horror because that's a, a genre that I've studied pretty extensively. Um, everything that I've ever, you know, I'm going to put everything I know, everything I've ever thought of. All of the game development theory, everything I've ever, you know, all of it is going to go in that book. Every last shred of it. I mean, I have an absolutely monstrous extent, well, it's, I mean, it's a pretty good sized list of stuff to do with things like uh, oft-used tropes within RPGs. Some would call them cliches, but I go through and I break them all down, and I explain what they are, why they tend to be used, the when they're being used, because are the right way to use them and the wrong way to use them. You know, I cover everything in that book, or I'm I'm covering it. 
you know, it's a work in progress. I'll finish it eventually. So, yeah. That is the video. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see y'all on the next one. Bye, did de bye, bye. Everybody. And don't forget to share the video and do all the rest of that good YouTube junk like subscribe, like, and all that nonsense. It's very much appreciated. Thank you one more time. I'll see y'all later. Bye-bye.